I want you to hit me as hard as you can. After Rocky and Rambo reached their peak in 1985 with Rocky IV and Rambo First Blood Part II, Sylvester Stallone gave us yet another badass character to root for the next year in 1986, one with sequel potential galore that unfortunately has not been fulfilled, and that man was named Marion Cobretti. Is that really a name? Cobra's roots are pretty interesting. The movie was beyond loosely based on the novel by Paula Gosling, Fair Game. Funny enough, another cinematic adaptation of the same novel was pumped out in 1995, starring William Baldwin and Cindy Crawford. And guess what? It totally sucked! Back up! Or what? Or I'll take your goddamn head off! Oh, shit! The bulk of Cobra's meat, insert generic sex joke here, I'd be sick not to want to sleep with you came from Stallone's work on Beverly Hills Cop. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, Sylvester Stallone was originally cast as Axel Foley. But once he read the script, he took it upon himself to change the main character's name from Foley to Colbretti, and he axed out most of the comedy while the visceral action set pieces were double downed on. The latter would have jacked up the budget, so Sly and Paramount, who didn't really care for what Sly was doing with the project, parted ways. Although apparently all involved said that Sly was a total gentleman about it, and they actually cast his wife, Bridget Nielsen, in Beverly Hills Cop 2 because his relationship with them was so strong. So Eddie Murphy, of course, took on the role of Axel Foley, and the rest is, as they say, cinematic history. I mean, who else could play Axel Foley but Eddie Murphy? It was meant to be. Disturbing the piece that got thrown out of a window! What's the fucking charge for getting pushed out of a moving car, huh? Jaywalking? But Sly's ideas did not go to waste. He wound up repurposing his Beverly Hills Cop material into a new script. Named after John Wayne, whose birth name was actually Marion Robert Morrison, Marion Cobretti, aka Cobra was born. The film was shot on a pretty sizable budget for 1986, $25 million, and it was co-financed by Canon Films and Warner Brothers. You see, there's no way Canon Films could have afforded $25 million Sylvester Stallone movie. I'm sure that they needed Warner Brothers' help to pay his salary. I was paying attention to business. Me too, I didn't notice. Of course, they would pay him a ton of money for Over the Top, but it wouldn't end so well for Canon, even though the film itself, in my opinion, is a bit of a classic. I'm through talking. So Cobra tells the rather heartfelt tale of an army of axe-wielding serial killers led by the Night Slasher, chillingly played by Brian Thompson, who spend their nights terrorizing LA, carving up folks. Oh yeah, and it's set at Christmas, a heartwarming Christmas tale for all. When a fashion model with ludicrously long legs, played by Stallone's then-wife Brigitte Nielsen, happens to see the face of their leader, she becomes a target with the Nazos stopping at nothing to waste her. Oh, and along the way, they kill David Rashi, aka Sledgehammer, who plays her sleazy photographer. Fear not. A man among men has been assigned to protect the lady. Armed with his slick trench coat, a matchstick in his mouth, a slew of macho one-liners, and some aviators, and a hot car, a custom 1950 Mercury, which was actually Stallone's own car with the amazing license plate Awesome 50, plus a myriad of amazing firearms, Cobra does the human laundry old school, because crime's a disease. I'm the cure. Thank you so much for watching Sylvester Stallone Revisited. If you like this type of content, make sure to click on the like button as well as the bell to receive notifications for all of our latest videos. Now back to the show. Clean up your act. Opening with a close-up of the Cobra design on Sly's gun and his raspy in America monologue. A murder every 24 minutes. Oh, I knew I was in for a badass macho ride when I first popped this in as a kid. Funny enough, the first time I ever babysat myself, I rented Cobra. Because, you know, it's a great movie for kids. The flick on paper is directed by George P. Cosmatos, who I think is an amazing director. But I say on paper because, much like Rambo 2, word has leaked out that Sly perhaps called a lot of the shots on those movies. It all goes back to Kurt Russell's stories about shooting Tombstone with Cosmatos as his quote-unquote director and him being basically 
hipped by Stallone to the fact that Cosmatos was kind of amenable to changes being made on set. So, hmm, whether or not Cosmatos was the actual director, I don't really know, but he definitely has credit. And the movie does have a lot of Stallone's visual style. If you watch Rocky IV and then you watch Cobra right afterwards, the movies have a lot in style, like his love of extreme close-ups and his cool, fast-paced MTV aesthetic, which I think Stallone really nailed at the time. So whoever it was that was responsible for what I saw, Stallone or Cosmatos, they deserve a cold beer because this movie is one slick, neon-heavy ride. I love everything about it. It's so 80s, it's so good. I also really like the moodiness of the piece. It's got a nice random noir mood with some heavy horror undertones. I think this is probably the closest Stallone ever got to making a legit horror movie, unless you count, you know, Detox, AKA I See You, which came out years and years later. Everything in this movie is so expertly choreographed and executed. I mean, I love this movie and the action is amazing. So the original cut of Cobra for the, was apparently two hours long but the film got trimmed down for two reasons. One, it was very violent to the point that the MPAA slapped it with an X rating, of course, which just wasn't gonna fly for an action film. And of course, Top Gun came out just before this movie did and it became a massive box office hit. I am dangerous. So the powers that be at Warner Brothers got a little bit cock shy, hence they went with a Slim Jim 87 minute running time in the name of having more screenings of the flick a day, hoping to bag more coin. For a while there was a very rare work print of the movie being circulated, but I never managed to get my hands on it. Even Shout Factory's recent 2019 collector's edition Blu-ray release of the film fell short in delivering us the missing footage, because it may not actually exist. It feels like the footage is lost, but in Sly we trust. If it's out there, Sly's gonna find it and he'll find you. I still have hopes that Sly may one day gain access to the original footage and work his magic on it as he did recently with Rocky IV and give us the Cobra director's cut we all deserve. Alas, it's just the dream. She's gonna wreck our new world and the dream. That said, the fat-free theatrical cut of the film is still a blast and a half. The first potent bullet in Cobra's canon was without a doubt the character of Cobra himself, who was an amalgam of everything that is manly and tough. I'm talking muscled up, tan like a mofo, slick, oiled up, short on words, and big on cracking skulls. The dude was clearly the 80s version of Dirty Harry. Do you know you have an attitude problem? Yeah, but it's just a little one. And I don't think it was a coincidence that two Dirty Harry alumni, Rennie Santoni, who plays the same role here but with a junk food addiction and a little more humor as Cobra's partner, and Andy Robertson, show up in Cobra. In fact, Andrew Robertson apparently was going to be revealed as the main villain at the end of Cobra, but it didn't happen and today just gets punched out because he's the annoying police chief that everybody hates. <laughs> No hard feelings, pal. Definitely some severe Dirty Harry connections in this movie. But Cobra goes much further than Dirty Harry in terms of having no boundaries as to what he can do or will do to take out the trash. You have the right to remain silent. Think of him as kind of a semi right wing superhero with an attitude. No country club prison cells for these clowns. It doesn't get more hardcore in terms of severe brutality and bad guys hitting the gravel hard than in Cobra. And of course, you know, Cobra's squad that he's part of, the zombie squad, tells you everything you need to know. I mean, that's how he considers these bad guys in this movie, zombies. So he just mows them down. Uh, just for your dirt bag. But it wasn't just the rough and tumble fight sequences that whooped me into a smile frenzy as a kid. No, it was that insane car chase that kicked my ass. All about that 180 degree turn where he shoots the baddies with his machine gun. Plus the lengthy suit outs, the various kill methods, or the sight of Cobra in the back of a pickup truck mowing down all kinds of varmints with his nifty automatic weapon, the rare and oh so cool Jaddy Matic submachine gun. Whenever I see the latter scene, I say to myself, life doesn't get much better than this if you're a hardcore gun nut, which I think Cobra is in the film. Oh, and who could forget the Night Slasher's iconic knife? Designed by Herman Schneider, the weapon was custom made at Sylvester Stallone's request as he wanted a weapon that audiences would never forget. And well, it sure worked on John Fallon, the guy who writes the series, because have you ever looked closely at the arrow in the head logo? Yes? No? No matter. You see the knife that he's holding? That's the Cobra knife. It's right there. Hashtag never forget. You have to take me in. If you can. 
The final notches on Cobra's too cool for school belt were its solid performances all around. Lee Garlington, especially, gave me the creeps as kind of the Night Slashes squeeze. Plus, it's got a really good score by Sylvester LeVay and some solid 80s pop rock ditties, including Feel the Heat by Jean Beauvoir. It's also got a love theme that kind of cracks me up with Bill Medley singing it just before he did Time of My Life for Dirty Dancing. Plus, it's got tons of priceless macho dialogue doozies like This is where the law stops. And I start. And it's Ode to Dirty Harry. Go ahead. I don't shock her. And of course, the disease. And I'm the cure. Priceless, my friends. Priceless. But it was not meant to be in terms of Cobra getting a sequel. The critics killed this movie, and when it was released, it was actually considered a box office disappointment by the studio, although it did gross over $12 million on its opening weekend, which was the largest opening weekend in the history of Warner Brothers and the Canon Group at the time. It eventually earned about $160 million worldwide, which on a $25 million budget means that it was a pretty big hit, right? Over the years, the film has gained quite a bit of a cult following with action fans, and even director Nicholas Wending Refn wound up being a huge admirer, hence the Cobra homage, in his 2011 thriller Drive. In the latter, the main character pimps a toothpick in his mouth, much like Cobra chewed on a matchstick. All in all, Cobra may not be perfect on paper. It's got some pretty big plot holes, I think probably due to the fact that so much of the film was cut at the 11th hour, but it pushes my right detonation buttons, resulting in one hell of a sit down when I groove with it. They definitely don't make gritty, politically incorrect, and no holds barred action thriller slasher movies like this one anymore. That's for damn sure. I saw Cobra many, 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 many times and have viewed it many times since. Loved it as a kid, love it now. Cobra rules. I pretty much know the entire movie by heart, right down to its musical cues. Feel the heat, feel the heat, feel the heat. So yeah, in my book of bad to the core action flicks, Cobra takes the high octane entertainment cake and shoves it up your yin yang. So strap on them leather gloves, whip out the scissors, and cut that frozen pizza up fervently while cleaning your gun. It's time well spent. I give this 10 out of 10 Stallones. You know what the trouble with you is? You're too violent. Mm. It's all that sugar you're eating.